it's the 4th of October 2010. I've come to the Royal Society's Cavley Centre, Chichley Hall. There's a workshop here entitled Towards a Scientific and Societal Agenda on Extraterrestrial Life. It promises to be a fascinating two days. With some very distinguished scientists here and uh, at least two of my favourite science fiction authors as well. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, participating. <laughs> Research fellowships. And this is thanks to this program that I stand here in front of you. Now, this meeting forms a counterpart to the Royal Society. Actually, the Germans are invading the USA. I know, I'm not quite sure about that. But she's going to talk to us about super Earths and life. A fascinating person. Thanks, Alan. Uh, and thanks, everybody. I'm very thrilled to actually be given the opportunity to actually start this meeting. As you've all heard, last week we, there was an announcement of one of the first among a couple incredibly interesting planets that we're just finding. And I remember when I started this field, there were some people who were actually telling me to go and do some serious science, not just science fiction, you know, do binary stars or something, whatever qualifies as serious science. Uh, and it's an amazing amazing thing to stand here today and actually can show you our models to basically try to track habitability or signs for life on other planets and already be able to tell you that we have potential candidates. We don't have the light of any of these planets yet. So we cannot tell you whether they're habitable or not. Because if you think about it, Venus and Earth are pretty much the same in terms of mass and radius. So just keep that in mind. But what we have is candidates, planets that are already really small, the ones we call super Earth. But now, since last week, we have one that's roughly at the right distance for, if it were rocky, to be in the ballpark where it could be potentially cozy on its surface for life to evolve. This is the big mass. This is the Jupiter masses. Um, the inclination of the orbit is not clear for most of those. For about 100 planets, we have this transit. That means the planet just goes in front between us and the star in our line of sight. For about 400, we don't have that information. It's just from geometry. Some of them transit, some don't. But what we have is that we find there are more, much, much more, and this is from radio velocity, and these numbers have gone up quite a bit, but the trend hasn't. So the big masses, we find very, very little planets. The, the small masses, Jupiter and smaller, mini Neptune, super Earth, we find a lot. We're getting to the realm where Earth and Venus is at. This region here is where we talk about super Earth. Things that are roughly up to 10 times the mass of Earth and roughly to about twice the radius of the Earth. And the exciting thing is that in this region, we have already found two objects. And I apologize that you don't see this better. But one of the objects is here, Corot 7b, and one of the objects is just a bit above the H2O line, GJ1214. So we have found two planets so far that actually have both the radius and the mass. Again, not all the planets transit. We found a lot more super-Earths mass-wise, but we don't have the radius for all of those. But we have two already. That's extremely exciting, because one of them, Coro 7b, is actually more dense than our own Earth. Probably hard measurement. Actually, tests for volcanism on exoplanets. And we have a paper out of that, even though it sounds very funny. It's very interesting because then you can figure out if this whole geochemical feedback works on all the <coughs> planets. And if it does, if our idea about habitability is actually correct. And so this is the planet that you've heard so much about. Well, this is the system you heard so much about. 2007, Udri et al. and Mayo and the Swiss group found this really incredible system of three planets. And of course, as you know by now, they are too warm. But the interesting thing was like, warm was just too hot, warm was just too cold. Basically, very Goldilocks sound. 
And I kept complaining that I wanted more in here. And the Swiss team were saying, we haven't found one, so I should have been complaining to the California team. So that they could actually have found one earlier. But so the new planet is just roughly somewhere in here. Okay, so the, uh, one of the, the many, many interesting things about, about Mars is um, it's increasingly turning into a geologist planet. Um, and, and if there's anything to take away from this talk, um, I think it's, it's the, the fact that, that Mars, like Earth, has a very rich and detailed sedimentary record. Um, it, it, it chronicles planetary evolution. The details of climate evolution on Mars are indeed written in stone. And uh, it's up to us to, to essentially read the record in the same way that we do for Earth. Um, before I start, it, it's noteworthy to, to say that Percival Lowell, uh, among others, was, was probably the one that did the most uh, in his time to, to kind of advance the idea of Mars being a boat for life. Um, go to the surface of Mars and access a sedimentary record that we can't access on Earth. And that's the exciting thing about what we're learning about Mars. Oh. So NASA's strategy, um, like others, has been a good one, and that water kind of filters through all the aspects of geologic history. And so if you follow the water, you stand to learn a lot about uh, the evolution of the planet and also how life may or may not have factored into that evolution. And so that's just separated from younger, younger intervals on Mars by the late heavy bombardment, the loss of the dynamo or the magnetic field, and in turn the loss of uh, the atmosphere. And so what this means is that life would have either had to start de novo after the late heavy bombardment, after the sterilizing effects, or life would have had to colonize some sort of subsurface refugium to be able to, to still, to still uh, soldier on uh, after the late heavy bombardment. But nevertheless, um, more exploration and, and kind of continuing to read the sedimentary record on Mars will, uh, will no doubt kind of uh, flesh out some of these questions. Thanks. David Brenn. Um, I'm wondering what you think of these uh, rebel groups out there of uh, mainline uh, astrobiologists who are gathering together to protest the dismissal of the uh, Viking labeled release results. There are more and more of them now, and they're forming a sort of a rebel alliance to try to get the whole issue um, reevaluated. And I wonder if you've been following that. It sounds to me like you would not be. Uh, that you'd be skeptical of, of their skepticism. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I suppose I would, but, but um, I'm not as well versed as I think I should be to, 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 kind, of, uh, to kind of have an opinion on that. Um, I guess in, in talking about extant life, it's interesting that we are learning much more about the properties of the soil, of, of modern Martian soil, right? That the Phoenix Lander told us quite a bit about the characteristics of modern Martian soil, and that might be a reason why the Viking results are being revisited, uh, because we're going out there with new tools. Um, in, in, terms, in terms of, of how biology, that extant biology might fare in soils, um, if I could place a bet, I'd say that it's quite harsh because of the UV environment, because of strong oxidizers and that type of thing. But, I mean, it's, it's quite dangerous to be able to commit to one side of the fence or another because, like I said, I'll never be surprised at, at what you know, microbial life is able to accomplish on Earth. There are always extreme strains, but the key is to think about this in an evolutionary context. If you want extant life, it would have had to have started somewhere, and it would have had, had to be able to survive some, some pretty catastrophic planetary events. That sounded like a skeptical to the power of three. <laughs> <laughs> but very polite. <laughs>
Actually, I've got one observation. We're looking for life on another planet. Look for caffeine. There's no way I function without it. <laughs> So, I really like your comment about the coffee, because one of the things uh, and, uh, that I wanted to say also before, I, I love this idea about uh, putting this um, idea wide open to even so we don't know what the geology on other planets is, maybe something else could be produced. And I wanted to make that point that you were making in the beginning with the caffeine mm -hmm. molecule is the one thing that we're kind of missing a little in astrobiology is even so we do this great cross-disciplinary work right now, is to actually go the kind of last step. When you have a different biota, uh, what would it produce? You know, I know we can make life in the lab, and so it's very hard to extrapolate that. But if we could get such a signature, whether it's be based on coffee, or whether it be based on arsenide or arsenide organisms, I think that would be a huge step forward for something that we could look for with telescopes. And one of the things that I wanted to know from what you were telling us, do you think there's any common denomination that you could use as a kind of coding or deciphering uh, way to actually decipher any message you might be getting? To me, the, the, the original thing was talking about the structure of the communication, the, the, the thing that's common to everything we know. Absolutely, but from that, do you think you, you were saying that underlying there is a similar structure in all the different languages that evolve and yeah. all the different pictographs that evolve? Mm -hmm. Even though <coughs> pictographs we're not going to see, but um, from that, do you think there's anything like, it's not a set of stone, but anything that you could use to whatever communication you could potentially get, you could use to decipher as a key to say there is some sentiment message in it or anything yeah, like that. The, well, the transparency I was talking about would um, facilitate that in the sense if you had it as an alphabetic and had, had, had enough information, anyone out there that was at least at our stage would be able to look at it and understand the patterns within it. But you can be very transparent in the sense that in the primer part of any message going out that you can 